So I just got done watching the new Bray Wyatt documentary and I thought it totally sugarcoated the reality of Bray Wyatt's WWE career. This WWE produced film goes to great lengths to ignore the years of frustrating booking and nonsense storylines that they lumbered this man with. Over two hours, they either gloss over or totally ignore their own failures like they never happened. Or even worse, they blame the man himself for those failures, saying that he was difficult to work with. Today, we're going to shine a light on all of those cracks that WWE whitewashed over in their documentary. I watched every moment of Wyatt's career, from his debut in 2012, right up until his last appearance in 2023, and in this video, I'm going to remind you of why his career ended up being a total mess. When Vince McMahon first got his hands on Wyndham Rotunda, it was back in 2010. He was part of the original NXT, and then he became a part of the Nexus, where he was known as Husky Harris. And once the Nexus storyline had fizzled out, WWE sent him back to developmental, and it was here that Wyndham started to create the character of Bray Wyatt, a charismatic yet sinister cult leader that delivered cryptic sermons in the middle of the ring. Wyatt made his NXT debut in 2012 and quickly got himself over as a heel with the fans. Very quickly, they stopped chanting Husky Harris at him as they realised how special this new character really was. Unfortunately, Wyatt suffered a setback in the form of a torn pectoral muscle, but he stayed relevant by leading Eric Rowan and Luke Harper to the ring, and he kept on cutting those haunting, weird promos. And it was during those promos that you could see the dedication in Wyndham Rotunda's eyes. When he was performing as this character, he was completely believable. The Wyatt family were called up to the main roster in 2013, and like so many debuts in WWE, it all started so well. They aired vignettes on Raw for weeks, all promoting the upcoming arrival of the Wyatt family. In July, they made their debut by assaulting Kane, and they spent the next few weeks taunting him before a Ring of Fire match was booked for SummerSlam. Thankfully, Kane did the right thing and put Wyatt over. While the match itself wasn't particularly good, it at least established Wyatt as a dominant new character, and so, for the next couple of months, he continued to establish that momentum by beating Kofi Kingston at Battleground and then getting into a feud with Daniel Bryan. Bryan was massively popular at the time, and Wyatt really benefited from working with him. The storyline saw Bryan apparently coming under Wyatt's spell when he joined the Wyatt family. The great thing about this angle was that it made Wyatt feel like an actual threat, like he had real influence over his fellow superstars. And it felt like a huge moment when Bryan eventually turned on Wyatt. The fans popped big time when he brutally attacked him in a steel cage on Raw, and it led to the best match at the 2014 Royal Rumble. This was a match that Wyatt won, and so his momentum continued to build up and build up, and things just kept on getting better when he entered into a feud with John Cena. Going into WrestleMania 30, there was so much positivity and excitement around this John Cena versus Bray Wyatt match, because a win over John Cena would have just been massive for him. But on the night, things didn't go as the fans expected. Cena beat him, and it felt like a massive mistake. Wyatt did go on to beat John Cena at Extreme Rules, but the damage was already done, and people would always remember the WrestleMania match over the Extreme Rules match. And so, WWE totally lost their way when booking Bray Wyatt. It just seemed to be another case of Vince McMahon losing interest in one of his toys. For the next few months, Wyatt treaded water in feuds with the likes of Chris Jericho and Dean Ambrose, and they ended up taking Eric Rowan and Luke Harper away from him. But as we headed into 2015, 
there was some hope for Wyatt in the form of a feud against The Undertaker. At Fastlane in February, Wyatt emerged from a casket and challenged The Undertaker to a match at WrestleMania 31, which he accepted. It was felt that a win over The Undertaker at WrestleMania would get Wyatt back on track. Taker's streak had only been broken the year before by Brock Lesnar, and to be the second man to beat him at Mania would have still been a massive deal. On the night, the men had a fantastic match against each other before The Undertaker beat Wyatt clean. And for the next year, things just got even worse as WWE fumbled with Wyatt's character even more. They decided to put the Wyatt family back together, but now including Braun Strowman as a new member, and they embarked on a feud with the Brothers of Destruction. It was here that Wyatt first developed supernatural abilities, which he'd apparently stolen from Kane and the Undertaker. As lame as this feud was, it would have been a good time for Wyatt to get his win back over the dead man. But no, Harper and Wyatt ended up losing to Kane and The Undertaker at the Survivor Series. A mismatched feud with The New Day came next, and this led to one of the dumbest angles of the year in the Wyatt compound match, which was just total garbage. And in one of the most senseless storylines in WWE history, Randy Orton decided to align himself with the Wyatt family at the end of 2016. They even ended up winning the tag team titles. Orton went on to win the Royal Rumble in January, and Wyatt won his first WWE Championship at the Elimination Chamber. Orton made a promise to Wyatt that he wouldn't challenge him at WrestleMania, but soon went back on his word during a segment where he burnt down Wyatt's compound. This whole situation raised more questions than it answered, Fans were left wondering why Orton sided with Wyatt in the first place all those months ago, and why wasn't Orton arrested for committing arson after burning down Wyatt's property? And why did Orton strike his trademark pose after doing so? Although I must admit, that bit was unintentionally hilarious. At WrestleMania, instead of the men having a straight-up wrestling match, they introduced more crap including projecting insects onto the ring mat, which was supposedly mind games or supernatural powers from Wyatt. During that match, Wyatt lost the championship too. The next month at Payback, the men fought in a House of Horrors match, which was a boring cinematic match where the rules made absolutely no sense whatsoever. This feud stood out as being a total shit show. Wyatt ended up treading water in the mid-card for a while, with feuds against the likes of Finn Balor and Matt Hardy, before they finally gave his character a new direction. Wyatt introduced fans to an entirely different persona, a cheerful, sweater-wearing host in a brightly coloured, seemingly innocent children's TV show. As the weeks went on, the Firefly Funhouse became the best part of Raw, as each segment got darker and more disturbing. And eventually, we were introduced to The Fiend, a character that supposedly embodied all of Bray Wyatt's darkest thoughts and feelings. The Fiend got off to a great start. He was super over with the fans, and he eventually beat Seth Rollins for the Universal title. They even designed a custom championship belt for him, but WWE just couldn't let it last. They didn't seem to be able to stay on to a good thing. They had Goldberg, of all people, beat him for the belt at Super Showdown. This was yet another example of WWE debuting something in an awesome way, only for them to lose interest just a few months later. Wyatt's next feud with John Cena was very good, with their feud culminating in a fantastic cinematic style match at WrestleMania 36. But then, things reached rock bottom for The Fiend when Alexa Bliss was introduced to his storylines. WWE should stay away from supernatural stuff, because more often than not, it just doesn't work. I mean, just look at this nonsense. 
and then much to the surprise and outrage of fans everywhere, WWE released him from his contract in July 2021. They did eventually bring him back in 2023 for a worthless feud with LA Knight that led to the atrocious pitch black match at the Royal Rumble, but that was it. Wyndham Rotunda sadly and unexpectedly passed away in August 2023. WWE's incompetence with the Bray Wyatt character is mesmerising to me that in the space of a decade, they got it so wrong so often with somebody that was so over with the fans would be funny if it wasn't so tragic. The constant meddling with the character and the losses to unworthy opponents and the constant stop and start pushes, this was all WWE's fault. It's only thanks to Wyndham Rotunda himself that the character managed to stay over with the fans in spite of WWE's terrible handling of him. And now it's too late to make it right.